All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to module two of our Rugby Canada Match Official Professional Development Webinar Series. Just to make sure everything is working out okay, if someone can just type in a question, then I'll know, or, or, uh, or in the chat box, just to let me know that the audio is working clearly. That would be great. Uh, in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll just give a quick rundown on how to use the program for anyone who needs uh, a hand. You should have um, a question box available to you that is um, on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free at any time to answer, uh, type in any questions you may have. However, uh, I will get to them at the end of the um, webinar. Thanks for those who quickly typed in there. That's excellent. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at... By the end of this, we will hopefully all have a better understanding of how this particular model fits into the Rugby Canada referee profile. So what are the attributes within the referee we're looking for over the course of um, their lifespan, in particular this season, and how can this information be supplemented by this or help us with this? Second piece is have a better understanding of the various Rugby Canada and World Rugby Under-19 law variations. How do they impact what we do out on the field? We're going to look at some examples of refereeing age grade rugby in practice as a point of reference. So we'll look at some video clips and we'll take a look at, great, now how do we uh, use this information to implement uh, what we do out on the field on a weekly basis? And finally, as, as per usual, we will be reminded of the importance of managing foul play throughout. So this is, these are the four things we're hopefully going to get out of the uh, session today. So we're going to take a look at how the how refereeing age grade rugby fits into our referee profile. So um, the focus here is on a holistic approach to the profile. Some of our um, modules later on in the year will take a look at more specific details. Here we're going to take a look at uh, a bit more of a holistic approach to it. So before we get into any type of specifics, I think the first question that we always need to ask ourselves is, well, what do we need to see at the age grade level? So refereeing senior rugby will always look for, not always, but we will look for different criteria for, well, what is our role as a referee? The first and foremost uh, thing at the age grade level is certainly safety, right? Anything we do around refereeing at this level needs to incorporate safety and player welfare as a key component of our, of our goals and outcomes. Trying to establish some continuity, so looking for ways to keep the play going. And the reason for this is we just want players to have more touches of the ball. It doesn't mean we don't want lineouts. It doesn't mean we don't want scrums when they're necessary. But what it means is we're going to look for ways to um, speed this process up and make sure we have um, good use of time when it comes to uh, getting the ball in, getting the ball out of uh, set pieces and restart some play to allow for us to get some more touches of the ball. So we'll take a look at some of those examples uh, as we go through the webinar. But if you were to look at any type of priority uh, within the three um, kind of foundation pieces of the referee profile, when we look at game management, technical and tactical. So from a tactical, uh, sorry, technical perspective, having a tackler release and move away from the tackle area quickly, as well as the tackle assist, clearly release the ball. These are probably the things that if we deal with these first from a technical perspective, hopefully everything else kind of falls into place after that to allow us to manage a game with, as we mentioned, that safety piece, the continuity piece, and allowing for a few more touches of the ball. From a tactical perspective, it's a little bit different in the sense that the contextual judgment piece here is what's going to allow us to try and afford that continuity. All right. So the more we're able to... to really dissect, okay, the situation of the game here means that I need to manage more verbally versus not. Does that mean I can put the, the whistle away a little bit? Um, or does it mean I can play away from certain situations that normally or in a senior match, I might not be able to play away from necessarily. So looking at that, and then I, I also put space, and it's not because I don't, uh, it's tough to say necessarily of all of the criteria or, or key factors within each of those uh, referee profile foundations, 
um, that there would be one for age grade that would be more important than others. I don't believe that's the case. Um, but what I'm, when I put space there as well as contextual judgment, I think that with the combination of the two, we would certainly be allowing for the opportunity for, for players to play without undue pressure and give us more opportunities for success. Later in the webinar, you'll see me refer to terms such as set yourself up for success. And I believe as a referee, if we focus on from a technical perspective, the tackler and tackle assist moving away from the ball as quickly as possible. And then from a tactical perspective, focusing on allowing for that space to be honored and then using our contextual judgment to make decisions will probably set us up for more success than not at the age grade level. And finally, from a game management perspective, obviously the most important piece here is our zero, zero tolerance for foul play. Uh, however, knowing that our communication, establishing that positive environment uh, and remaining calm are all things that we'll need to maintain over the course of a game, uh, understandably, especially the communication piece. And we will look at particular examples of communication as we get into some of the more technical pieces of refereeing each grade level rugby. So uh, World Rugby and Rugby Canada's age grade variations. Nothing new from World Rugby. What I'm not going to provide is a comprehensive list of it all, so be sure to visit uh, laws.worldrugby.org. Um, but the most notable pieces that we need to be reminded of are Law 3 when it comes to number of players, whereby in a, in a roster of 22 players, we want to have six trained front row uh, players on the roster. Um, and then the second point here is that it allows the variations for under-19s allow for replacements for injury. So players who have been tactically removed um, can always come back on to um, replace an injured player. Now, I wanted to make a note here that there's always some differences depending on what competition you're refereeing. For sure, you're up to date. And what I mean by that is some uh, competitions will allow for um, unlimited substitutions in some ways, always, of course, uh, hopefully at a stoppage where the referee is able to, to monitor who's coming off and who's going on. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, where we have a limited number of rosters of 22, we're looking for six trained front row players. And then in more, I guess, uh, representative levels of competition at age grade level where we might only allow for uh, those seven replacements that are listed, uh, we, we will allow substituted players or tactically substituted players to return to the game to replace an injured player. So just, just be sure you're aware of what some of those differences are depending on what competition you are refereeing at that time. Uh, law five, when it comes to time in a match, so matches are 70 minutes maximum. For age grade rugby, a lot of competitions will have uh, 60 minute matches and allow for some extra time if we end up in a tie situation, especially uh, as we get into some playoff rounds perhaps. Um, and then obviously a maximum of 90 minutes in a day. So everyone needs to be aware when we're scheduling tournaments, make sure that everyone's aware of, of what these, these limits are for playing in a day as well as playing in a game. It just goes back to that first point about being sure you're up to date with the competition you're refereeing at that time. Excuse me. And then Law 19 at Scrum Time is where we have the most um, differences from senior law. So we look for trained type five. So instead of saying trained front row only uh, at the senior level, at under 19s, we must have uh, trained type five. So players who are unable to play in the second row, um, whether it's due to injury or replacements, um, and they have not been trained in those positions, we may need to go to uncontested scrums in those instances. So just being aware of that. Um, always matching numbers in a scrum. So when we have players removed uh, from the field, whether it be through uh, yellow cards or whether it be through injury, um, knowing that we always have to manage the number of players in the scrum. So if we have 8v8, obviously we have a regular scrum. If we have 7v7, the uh, number eights are moved back to the back line. And then if we have six, our two flankers are moved to the back line and our number eights come back in. And then obviously five is the least amount of 
uh, players we can have in the scrum, so 5v5 with no back row. Okay, and then resetting with a 45 degree wheel and limiting the push to one point one and a half meters. And we'll look at managing that um, when we get to some of the video of the practical pieces. But just being aware of, of uh, what those differences are between scrum time at under 19s and scrum time at uh, senior level. The one area where it is the same, and it's important that people note the italicized word there, uncontested. So we must have eight versus eight in an uncontested scrum which is the same as, a, as the senior law. So in instances where we might lose uh, two tight heads props, whether it be through injury or, or sanctions, and we need to move to uncontested scrums, we need to fill in the scrum to have 8v8, even though with, there will be no push. So just something to be aware of, but the 8v8 is only in uncontested scrums. I know when this first came out, it was a bit of a sticking point, but uh, something that uh, I just wanted to reiterate there. So, and, and again, uh, there, there will be a section on, on the practical side of refereeing this, but um, what does this mean for the referee mostly? Well, understanding that the reason why we have these variations to start with is due to obviously player welfare and the need to ensure that we uh, are properly um, taking care of the players that when they're on the field and giving them opportunities for uh, rest and replacement for injury and all, all the things that come with that. When in doubt, we're, we do want to look to make quick decisions on the side of caution. So uh, unplayable um, situations at the ruck where we have several bodies on the ground that aren't able to move in a funny looking contact situ situation. We, we instead of penalizing perhaps one team or the other, and we don't feel that's an appropriate decision, let's make really quick unplayable decisions in that case. So as to avoid players piling onto each other. So those are situations where if it's on the side of caution and it's an easy decision for us to make, let's make, let's make that decision very quickly. And finally, um, obviously with the, um, as part of Rugby Canada's PlaySmart program, when it comes to your registration um, as a match official with Rugby Canada, needing to complete the World Rugby Online Concussion Management module, otherwise known as recognize and remove is the policy that we use. And this last point is extremely important for us to remember. There's absolutely, under any circumstance, no head injury assessment of any kind in, in domestic rugby. The only levels of rugby in Canada that would potentially have the HIA protocol is at the international level when our national teams are playing. And even then, it does not always happen. There is a very specific set of criteria that needs to be met for the HIA to take place, and there is no accommodation for it at any level of the game in Canada. So if we recognize that someone is uh, exhibiting symptoms of concussion, there's our responsibility and it is a collective responsibility to remove that player, they're done for the rest of that game, and then there's a return to play protocol that they can go under and follow along after that. Just a point I wanted to make sure we reiterated. Okay, Rugby Canada age grade law variation. So the World Rugby Variations follow a U19 and below um, structure, whereas uh, what we did last year was put together the uh, Rugby Canada version of age grade variations from the U7 age group all the way up to U19s in two year intervals with an introduction to contact at U13. So um, the document went under a full review at the end of last year, thanks to a review committee. It is in the process of, uh, the changes have been approved. They are just with our graphic designer. Um, as we can see, there's an old logo there. Um, so we're just looking at changing a few things uh, in the document, as well as a couple of technical pieces within the document. But again, the most important piece to remember is that player welfare is the guiding principle notably at the introduction to contact level. So what we did want to do with this document is look to ensure we're being very player-centered in our approach to game management and skill development. So one of the things you will notice in that document, for instance, when it does come out, and it will be shortly, is um, that it will, um, for instance, around the offside line, allow for very, 
very flexible interpretations depending on what teams are able to do um, and communication between coaches prior to matches as well as whether it be a game manager or appointed official looking at how they can work with the coaches on on um, ensuring that players are both safe but have opportunities to play within the skill sets they have another example would be um, jumping in the line out where when it's introduced there could be opportunities for um, teams or, or the possibility of one team not actually being competent in that area of the game and wanting for safety reasons to not have uh, jumping in the line out and that would be a communication between the coaches and the referee. So the way that the document will be laid out will allow for some interpretation in that area which I think is only appropriate given um, what we're trying to do in that area of the game. All right, so, I mean, that was pretty quick when it comes to um, the variations themselves. I think where we'll get uh, far more discussion and possibly some questions out of, out of this module is taking a look at some examples in practice. So unfortunately, I can only put five handouts as part of the attachment to this uh, program, the GoToWebinar program, and I've got, uh, not far more, but I do have more than five video clips to show. So instead of um, putting uh, separate video clips there for you guys to, to follow along with, what I've done is I've left them in this presentation. And then once this presentation is put up online, which it will be uh, along with last week's, then uh, the presentation will, will have a much less laggy video. Unfortunately, when we stream video through a webinar, the quality of the, the stream isn't great all the time, but um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to put them in there as we go. But I will make sure to freeze frames and take a look at um, some particular instances here. So when we look at refereeing age grade rugby, there's, there's really three areas of the game that I've uh, focused on. And then uh, from a technical perspective, um, using our tactical and game management tools to help us along and then um, uh, uh, finally one game management specific piece at the end. So uh, the first area and an area that often um, provides us with some areas to focus on from game to game, uh, especially at the age grader level where we have some introductory, um, introductory levels of competition is our scrum management. So what I want us to do is take a look at a couple of examples and then I'll look at uh, how is it that we can help set ourselves up for success? So this video example is a good one of um, why we reset or how we reset. Um, and we'll take a look at what led to the situation that needed the scrum reset here. So we'll just watch this through and then if I have to, I'll play it again. Oh, my apologies. There we go. Right, so what the referee has done really well here is obviously reset once the scrum goes beyond the 45 degrees. Even though the ball may have been playable at this level, we may want to make sure that resets are done appropriately due to the fact that it is a safety concern at times, especially when scrums go beyond 45 at this age level, um, they can tend to collapse inwards. So um, no issues with the referee making this decision whatsoever. Let's take a look at why we got to this place where we needed the reset to start with. And I think if we take a look at off um, crouch, bind, and set, we didn't really have a whole lot of stability at the set. And then that allowed us for some movement on the white loose head side forward and the blue loose head side forward, which caused the scrum to start rotating before the ball was even in. So right away, that's probably an indication to the referee that the scrum is gonna move a little bit. So it's a good time for the referee maybe to blow it up even a little bit sooner in order for us to get that stability at set. And we'll take a look at uh, what a good stable scrum does look like. Otherwise, the referee does everything right here from there on, looking at opportunities to get the ball out and realizing that we probably need to come back up for a scrum reset here, which is well done. I might come back to the scrum as well in a moment. 
once we look at how we set ourselves up for success. So game, uh, good management of a scrum here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at two scrums in a row and look at uh, how the referee managed it from one situation to the next. So what I'll do is I'll play it through again and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. Now I know we can't hear the referee, but I think we can all see what happened there with the conversation. And let's see how this film looks. Okay. I thought the referee did really, really well in this instance. So um, when we look at the first instance uh, the first scrum here, what we'll notice is that we do have some pretty good stability after the set. However, maybe not before that. So if we watch one more time here, take a look at bind. There's a little bit of pre-engage on this red tight head side before the red loose head side goes in. So that could be one of the reasons why we end up with a little bit of instability. The scrum is pretty stable when the ball goes in, but then we have the wheel almost a 45 by the time the ball gets out. I think it's a good play on here by the referee. But what I really like about what the referee does here is he turns around and has a conversation with the players about the scrum wheeling and asking them to maintain a good, strong, straight body position. So you'll see that piece around how that scrum wheeled, asking them to stay straight. Maybe not identifying the root cause of it, but certainly looking to address one of the pieces around it. The second piece that he does really well in this instance is once the ball comes in, I think we have better stability before the set here as well. Um, once the ball comes in and we have a straight push by red, which is legit, uh, he's able to communicate to the players to stop the push at one and a half meters. So instead of looking to penalize in that area where it may have gone just a little bit over one and a half meters, I think the referee does a good job of ensuring green has the opportunity to play the ball out. Red has an opportunity to hear him say stop and we're able to get the ball out and recycle that ball there. So I thought the referee did really well in that instance. And then obviously, what does a good scrum picture look like? Ironically enough, this was the first scrum of this game, I believe. Um, but I think what we see here is some pretty good body position by the players. Perhaps like to see a slightly flatter back by uh, the red loose head but otherwise they do a good job of staying in good strong pushing positions staying square and allowing that ball to come in and the ball to come out so when we look at setting ourselves up for success we do want to focus on that stability before moving from one call to the next so from crouch to bind we want to see stability before we say bind and then again off the bind we want to give it uh, just a hair longer to make sure we have that stability from bind to set. It's one of those instances where I think we need to have a pretty good feel for it. Sometimes we'll see, as we do in this one, where we don't quite get our timing right, but we end up with a decent outcome at the end anyways. So we still had some movement at, between bind and set with a little bit of that pre-engage. But at the end of the day, we ended up with an okay outcome. Unfortunately, we had a knock-on, another scrum, and then we had that management piece. So um, looking for that stability is probably the most important part going from between crouch and bind, and then bind and set, and then finally waiting for stability before we allow that ball to come in. So when we compare that to our good scrum here, I think what we'll see is that we had some pretty good stability all the way through between calls and then before that ball comes in. The second piece, and I didn't write it down, and I probably should have, uh, I apologize, but is looking at good square body position. So making sure that our feet of the front row players especially are all underneath them. They're in a good position to be able to push and that they keep their shoulders square as they go through that, um, that pushing sequence. 
So when we see all those pictures coming together, I think we end up with a really good scrum. Um, what we will do is go on to discuss um, scrum in more general terms and sorry, more specific terms at a later date in a different module. I don't want to get too technical. What I want us to do is understand that there's um, setting ourselves up for success at this level looks really, really simple. It looks like, do we have stability before calls? And do we have good straight pushing positions? So again, when we come back to this one here, I think we had some decent body position. Oh, my apologies, but not great. Um, decent body position, but not great stability in between necessarily the calls or before the ball comes in. All right, so just something to be aware of. Perhaps legs a little straight in the front row here. Tough to see from this angle. But otherwise, a good reset. Okay, so that's scrum time. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to add those in as we go, and I'm happy to come back to some clips in particular if people have questions after the fact. Uh, but we're going to move on to line-out management. So again, looking at age-grade stuff, we talked about scrum management um, from a technical area and looking at specific ways to help us be successful. So at line-out time, especially with teams that are very, very new to the game, there's a couple things we want to make sure we do. I think this is a really good example of a referee taking the time to ensure that the front players in the lineout are clear on, on establishing the gap, ensuring their teammates are lined up with them, and then making sure we have the numbers in the right place. Having, uh, allowing for the gray team here to know when we move forward. And the other piece I really like about this is that we have a very, very nice gap good meter, ensuring that there is ample opportunity for the referee to be able to see infringements from one side to the, or the other. Right. What's our example here? The other piece I like is, was this throw necessarily super straight? Perhaps not, but I'm very happy with the play on in that instance. Um, at the end of the day, we want the ball to be recycled and we want opportunities for players to get touches on the ball. I think that's a very good play on throw. Credible enough for us to be able to move on to the next one. Okay, what I do want us to take a look at is what does a negative picture in the lineup look like? Not the most egregious example, um, but certainly one that we can take a look at. So the referee, I think, does a good job of uh, ensuring that the lineup is getting set and we'll come back to this in a moment, the system referee helping the referee out. Then we have just a bit of a pull in the air. So what I'll do is I'll come back to this. The referee, I believe, come back, comes yeah, back to the penalty pretty quickly. So I will show us that picture kind of in a stop, um, in a freeze frame. But let's just take a look first at what are our keys to success. So. Um, for starters, ensuring we have established two clear lines, okay? We want to ensure players are in proper position, and we want to keep a good gap. Those are the three things that I think are um, allowing us to set ourselves up for success. When we look at higher level games, uh, representative rugby, even at the under, at the age grade level, can we allow um, the trend in the game now is for teams to quote unquote walk into a line out? Um, the condition needs to be that, that the numbers are clear and the numbers haven't been established and changed and that uh, the receiver needs to be clearly outlined. So those three things need to happen. So instead of going to look at an example of that mess, let's just keep it at what is it we actually want to see uh, for now. We can go and try and dig out some examples afterwards, but what I'm really concerned with here is let's establish two clear lines. Let's make sure all the players are in their proper position and let's keep that good gap. So if we come back to this example of dangerous play, picture we don't want to see, let's just look at setting ourselves up for success first. So our referee here does a good job of pointing players to get into the lineout. The AR does a good job of establishing where the thrower needs to be. 
So we have a good opportunity here to referee this line out really well. We have a clear gap. We have an opportunity for the referee to see what they need to see in the air. And then we'll see what happens. So we'll see just as the player is about to come down in blue uh, or stripes, that the player in blue behind him, the defensive player here, just gives a tug on the shoulder as the player is coming down. And we'll see the tilt back there by the player in stripes. Excellent decision on my, on, uh, uh, in my opinion by the referee here. It establishes the boundaries of what is appropriate um, contact in the air. There's always some room for contact in the air provided it's going for the ball and there's an opportunity con to contest for the ball. In this instance, once the contest is over for the ball, the player in blue, the defensive lineout player in the air, should not be in any way touching the player, the stripe player who uh, does win possession of the ball in the lineout. Right? All you do is put that player in a position, um, the strike player in a position to be injured or in a dangerous position. Where uh, the referee did well is it's penalty only, and we can see his communication after the fact uh, with the signal, allowing players to know what's going on. Um, but where we might see more severe sanctions is if that strike player lands on their back, where we would have a yellow card, and obviously if they landed in a more dangerous position on their head or neck, or we would have a potentially a red card. So things to be aware of at lineout time. Managing the tackle. So we're going to take a look at a dangerous tackle, and this is probably the most common type of dangerous tackle that we'll see in age grade rugby. And then we'll take a look at what a good tackle looks like. Right, so the referee, I think, did really well there. Um, unfortunately, we can't hear audio on the video, but uh, to not play advantage from the situation, although it's potentially a try scoring opportunity, the, re the, um, the preference, uh, especially in, um, in areas of foul play, is that we um, deal with that foul play immediately. We need to make sure that players understand that their actions are unacceptable and that they need to change. And oftentimes, if we simply play advantage, that message might not quite come across. So if we take another look at the example here, um, the key focus point for me is on the body position of the potential tackler. So the player in blue here doesn't do a great job of getting low. So ideally, we want to see tacklers um, initiating contact much lower, right? And then we'll see, it's difficult to see, but we see the outside arm wrap around over top of the shoulder. So a lot of referees in the game in general has referenced that as the seatbelt tackle. So looking to eliminate those tackles where we have players reaching around over the shoulder to then try and pull players, uh, the ball carrier down. So we'll take another quick look at what that body position looks like. It's just the trigger for the referee to be aware of as they go through refereeing that um, instance. Player gets up, no injury, no issues there. Where the referee might have a different decision is if the player, uh, the tackler took the ball carrier down by the neck as opposed to over the shoulder. But if they use their neck to leverage or wrench that player to the ground, uh, they would obviously potentially be liable to be sanctioned differently there, possibly with a yellow card or a red card, depending on the outcome. All right, so what does a good tackle look like? I find it's always useful for us to take a look at positive pictures when we're out refereeing our games. Really, really simple picture of a good, good positive tackle. I know there, there is a little bit of a lift on behalf of the tackler here, but what the tackler does exceptionally well is keep their feet moving. So if we watch the tackler, number 11, I believe, green, they keep their feet moving through the entirety of that contact area. So um, where the ball carrier obviously can help protect themselves a little bit better is by getting lower going into contact. I um, believe this player, number 11 as well, for red, was trying to step and just was a little late trying to step to that space on the inside of green 11. But green 11 does a great job, head on the outside of the tackle, nice low body position. Just find my cursor. Wrap all the way through. 
feet driving forward and brings the player down safely. <clears throat> so when we look at setting ourselves up in, for success, we don't see the referee in this picture, but two things that for me help obviously are looking at zero tolerance for foul play. Um, so having that mindset going into tackle situations uh, will be critical for referees. And finally, uh, ensuring we're in a good position to see the action, so looking to be ball in line. Positioning is our, our module three topic, so we will go more into how do we get ball in line, how do we look to referee that way, um, and there was a, excuse me, the reason why we had these three modules to start with, with game prep and review, refereeing age grade rugby and positioning, are because I think those are the, these are the three things that will help us best prepare for refereeing age grade rugby, which is for the most of the country, the first form of rugby we see. And then we'll take a look at um, uh, positioning next, or not next week, but next month, in terms of how do we get in those positions. But when we look at setting ourselves up for success, I think those are the things we need to do. If we go back and look at this, um, this instance here once more, unfortunately, we can't see the referee in the picture, but where they come across from, the referee does seem to be in a good position with that ball in line to have seen that instance. We have a quick question here from Stuart. Um, so a question about why not sanctioning after allowing advantage and a try, and I believe this is obviously in reference to the first tackle situation here. So um, again, allowing for that contextual judgment, I wouldn't mind either way. Um, I would obviously only sanction after a try if we're going to yellow card. If um, we're playing advantage and we're allowing the try to be scored in this first instance, then we wouldn't come back to anything other than maybe having, and not maybe, but other than having a conversation with number 11 blue about how they completed that tackle. So I don't personally have a problem with playing the advantage out. However, what I want us to know is that it needs to be appropriate for the situation in the game. If it's the first high tackle penalty of the game and it's over very quickly and there's no melee or dust up afterwards and we can get a try and deal with the instance, uh, the incident and the player after the try has been scored, then obviously no issues there. If, um, if it's an instance that's pretty egregious and requires more action and there's slow ball and the situation is different, then we might need to deal with it immediately. So I would trust referees to use their judgment in that instance, but certainly, um, but certainly no issues with playing advantage. <clears throat> All right, and the last one is playing advantage. Hey, yo. Um, so I want us to take a look at an example of some good advantage here. And I'll get to uh, the picture of um, the clear and obvious a little bit later. I believe the referee is mic'd up in this situation, and I believe they call advantage over just there. Um, and we've had an opportunity for some continuity, good touches of the ball, Players are able to continue playing. And then I believe we get to the next infringement where we cannot play any advantage. So there's an attempt to manage the situation. Obviously the player um, just doesn't be, isn't able to react in time. So we have to penalize right away. So if we take a look at advantage as it pertains to age grade rugby, <clears throat> what I think we need to focus on is what are we trying to get out of these matches? The first instance of continuity, opportunity, and um, uh, sorry, opportunities to handle the ball and then keeping the game safe. So with this advantage, and I do want to play it again one more time, is that a lot of these um, tackle, uh, sorry, penalty situations end up with tap and goes. And so would the outcome have been any different if we blow the whistle here as opposed to play through this advantage? Probably not. The other point is that some might feel, well, this advantage is pretty quick. But we've had two significant line breaks and opportunities for the team to move the ball. 
So by the time we say advantage over here, I think what we've done is we've allowed the teams to play to what their um, um, skill sets are and what we're probably going to have as an outcome, regardless of whether we blow the whistle later or earlier um, in that advantage sequence. So I think the referee does a really good job of reading the game here to allow them to know that, you know, my advantage doesn't need to be 40 meters. The territorial advantage of maybe 10 or 15 meters in this instance is probably enough because we're able to reestablish the same type of rugby that we would have had um, and that opportunity for continuity and that opportunity for handling the ball than if we had blown the penalty or come back to the penalty if the ball had slowed down. So just a, a piece to, to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, the last piece I wanted to, to bring up, and this will be kind of noted in the CMO notes as well, but the thing I also really liked about this is that these are really, these are the easy decisions to make, and these are the, the decisions we really want to make. So outside of making sure that we've honored or the defense has honored that space, which I think they do a good job of here, we want to make sure that this gray team now who's won the collision is able to present the ball back and the ball still at the feet of the base of the ruck, has an opportunity to move it. That opportunity was taken away. Easy decision. These are the types of decisions that we want to make sure we make throughout a rugby game um, as they're kind of obvious to the whole world. <clears throat> okay, a couple notes uh, for coaches and match officials, which is something I'm just trying to make sure we incorporate into all of our um, webinars. So just some questions that the CMO can ask. Um, of the referee or, or of the plan that the referee may have put forward, but does the referee have a good idea of what we want to see out of this particular rugby game? Um, does that leave room for technical flexibility? So are we blowing the whistle when it is clear and obvious? And the advantage clip, like I mentioned, is an excellent example. So what I mean by technical flexibility, and this goes back to our... Um, our key point around the tactical area of the game when it comes to um, using our contextual judgment is when we look at, um, for instance, areas of the game where we have a technical infringement that it doesn't really matter to the outcome of the game and it's not in any way unsafe, then are we able to play on from it? So this example from the advantage clip is a really good example of something we probably can't play on from. It's just too clear and obvious for us, which is fine. Um, but if we look at situations where we have slight players off their feet, but it doesn't slow the ball down, inaccurate cleanouts again, that don't slow the ball down, are we able to continue to play on from those? All right. And then finally, the last question a CMO should always be able to ask uh, for referees before their age big games is, is player welfare a key focus and how is it made a priority by the official? I think at the end of the day, as long as we're taking a look at taking off these boxes and ensuring that zero tolerance for foul play is a key priority of refereeing and that CMOs are following up on that particular area of the game, um, when it comes to that post-match review and pre-match planning, as well as those other pieces that we spoke about, tackler and tackle release clearly moving away from the ball, right? And allowing for that contextual judgment um, to help us identify where we can play away from. And then finally, that advantage piece, how appropriate is our advantage for the level of rugby we are refereeing? So those are probably the three areas coaches and match officials can really help a referee prior to their match. All right, and then finally, our reminder about player welfare and where some of our resources are, just that zero tolerance around foul play, especially at this age grade level. So we still have the video from our 2017 Rugby Canada Law Implementation Guide, which has more clear examples of foul play that can be sanctioned with a penalty, yellow card, or red card, depending on the severity of the incident. And then obviously our resource at the uh, World Rugby Laws of the Game site, which has similar video content and then um, other pieces around um, managing the game from a safety perspective, collisions in the air, et cetera. Okay, that is it.
that was our presentation for today. So good 45 minutes, which leaves us about 15 minutes if anyone has any questions. So outside of the question earlier from Stuart, I don't believe we have anything yet, but I will give it a couple of minutes and uh, just see if anyone has anything they want to fire away with. I think um, what's clear is that there is obviously an understanding of that priority of player welfare. The other thing, um, I mean, we can just have a quick question about um, what does it mean to coach players as a as a referee? Um, what, where do we want to step in as as a referee to, to you know? Make sure that we're ensuring that players are, are engaging safely in the contest, um, but not obviously over coaching. So what's the balance between, let's say, penalizing versus um, uh, allowing things to play on or talking the players through? I think that depends entirely on the level of game and where the uh, players are within their levels of contact. So um, the first piece would be around scrum management. If helping players identify ways to stay in stronger body position, focusing on hips above, uh, hips below shoulders, focusing on square uh, body position, and making sure that the chest is open, and allowing for players to um, get in a good strong pushing position, that can be areas that we can help players out with between scrums or just before we um, start to get our setup. Um, but when we talk about areas, let's say around the clean out. Um, Perhaps when we're making contact around the head, whether it's through a neck roll or a cater roll of some kind, um, perhaps the approach might be to penalize first and then have a conversation as we perhaps walk to the next line out or get ready to scrum or something with that player to say, hey, by the way, just remember that this is an action that we can't allow. Um, so a question about where we can find the presentations. So I will uh, take us, sorry, to that real quick. Um, where we will be able to find them is on the Rugby Canada site shortly and then on um, Rugby Canada's YouTube page. So, um, John, I will post that. I will pop that up here in a moment. Just give me a second. And then as I do that, I'll address another, any other questions. Um, are there any key areas or changes to be expected in the U19 Rugby Canada laws upcoming? No, Rugby Canada's under-19 laws are um, directly related to World Rugby's laws of the game. And between now and uh, the end of 2019, we will not see any changes in that area. So another question about where some of the resources are available, and I'll pull that up from Stuart, referee um, resource page. So give me one moment to put this in here, and I'll pull that up. Um, a question about making sure that um, everyone has an understanding about scrum numbers in um, age grade rugby. So, yes, real quick, when we have um, less or fewer than eight players in a scrum, so let's say, for instance, the number five for uh, Team Blue was um, sent to the sin bin and they're off the field and um, we now have fewer players available in the scrum, so the number six moves into the number five position, and then the number eight leaves the scrum for team blue. We now have to, sorry, the number eight moves to the number six, so I mean, re let me restart that, let me restart that situation. Let's say we have number five blue who's been sent to the sin bin, and we have to have number eight blue step into that number five position, and they are, in the second row and they are trained in the second row, which is great because we can maintain contested scrums. Then we keep our two flankers on team blue. Team red would then have to have their eight, uh, their number eight move to the back line of the scrum. So we have to have seven V seven in contested scrums at under, uh, at age grade variations. Let's say that um, then the number seven for blue gets injured, so the five and the seven are both off the field, and there's no one else 
um, to play in that back row position for Team Blue, then we can move to five, uh, sorry, six v six scrums, in which case we would then have the um, number eight for Blue move back to the number eight, for instance, or they can stay in the five position and the Blue number six can move into um, the number eight position and we have no flankers. So when we have six versus six, we now have no flankers, um, but we have the eight number eight position back in the scrum and then Team Red would have removed their number eight and their number, um, sorry, the number eight would come back in the scrum and the number six and seven will be removed from the scrum. Sorry about that. I know it was a little lengthy there, Karen. Thanks for the question. Yeah, so um, great question about managing senior rugby groundwork technique. Now they're finding, okay. So great question from Daniel. How are we managing the senior rugby groundwork techniques that are finding their way to age grade rugby? For instance, extra rules, extra distance taken by ball carriers. So uh, unfortunately I don't have a, a video clip of age grade rugby uh, performing those acts. Daniel, as you mentioned in terms of uh, that extra role on the ground and such. I think at the end of the day, we need to go back to what's our philosophy around um, What's our philosophy around age grade rugby when it comes to continuity, safety, and opportunities for touches of the ball? So, um, what I would say to that is, if we if we can allow the play to continue because it's the it's the uh, best thing for the game in that moment, I think that's probably where we want to end up. In the situation where we have the extra role, um, what I would want to see is that we have clear support players. So if we have defenders who are clearly in good positions to be able to contest the ball and not enough support, and the extra role is what causes that um, attacking team to be able to retain possession, that might be an opportunity to, to penalize that. So playing the ball on the ground in an instance where there is clearly a contest on, would probably be appropriate. Where we have no contest really because the support players are clearly over top of that ball carrier, and the slight little extra rule doesn't really change what would have been the outcome there, I think we can probably play away. So where it doesn't affect safety, where it doesn't affect the ability to um, ensure we have some continuity and uh, for players to be able to touch, uh, have more touches of the ball, I think we can play on, Daniel. Hope that works. Okay, so I'm just going to pull these up here now just to help people with that resource piece. So. Uh, for those who are looking for the um, pre-match plan, post-match review form, when we hit HQ and match official development on the Rugby Canada website, we can scroll down to our referee match review form, and we can download the PDF from here. And it's a fillable PDF online, or it's a fill fillable PDF after you've downloaded it. Um, as for the video around... There we go. Dangerous play. When you go to the Rugby Canada Communications site on YouTube, our 2017 Law Implementation Guide playlist is there. And the playlist is also, the link to the playlist is available on this, um, on the slides that are at the end of the presentation. So that'll be made available. And what we should do actually is probably just add a link to that in this section here, which I'll make sure that we do that. Um, but for our next call, our next webinar. Okay, we have time for a couple more. I've got one more question here. In under 19 law, when one team is down to seven players in the scrum and the scrum is awarded to the opposition, do they have the option of putting eight players would the team that is down a player need to bring someone in to match so they both have eight players? So the answer to that, John, is no. Players, uh, or sorry, teams that have a reduced number of players in the scrum are the ones who would be able to decide if they want to bring a player in to have eight in the scrum or not. What they, um, what we don't want to have is an attacking team be able to benefit one way or the other because they feel they can change um, the number of players in the scrum. So instead of it being on the attacking team necessarily to decide, 
excuse me, the onus is on the team that has been reduced by a player to decide how they want to um, manage their scrum. So uh, if they feel as though they, you know, can't or don't have anyone who's appropriately trained to play that position um, in the scrum, then no, we will not force a team to bring an eighth player into that scrum. So a uh, question about, from Jean-Louis, is it okay for a province to set extra safety rules around U15 in that contact introduction? So uh, the answer is potentially yes. There's an avenue for provinces to establish their own variations on the laws, uh, provided we get Rugby Canada and World Rugby approval, depending on what the law is necessarily. From a safety perspective, obviously, we're usually more inclined to say yes than no. Um, how uh, I don't, but but I don't want to say that without saying that it, it really does depend. So, the the more important piece is um, let's let's wait and see what uh, comes out of the age grade law variations, and look at um, how we establish um, those sets of laws at U15 and U13, especially that contact introduction phase, like you mentioned. See see what you think might need to be amended, and then make a decision from there. At the end of the day, um, we're all trying to make the game safer. If there's something that's new that we don't yet have um, or haven't seen or don't know about and, and the province is keen to really try something, then we can take a look at it for sure. At the end of the day, though, we need to be aware that when we start making several variations that uh, we're not putting players at more risk because we're asking coaches to adjust significantly in some areas when we're trying to learn new things as well uh, for players. So um, have the conversation once the age grade law variations document comes out with your provincial union, and then fo please follow up with me on things that you feel might need to be amended or changed. Okay. That was it for the questions. We have a couple of minutes if anyone has anything. Doesn't look like it at the moment. So wait, wait, wait. Thanks, Jean-Louis, appreciate it. All right, folks, I think that's it. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your Monday evening. I will be doing this again tomorrow en français. So if anyone has anything they would like to discuss, please feel free to reach out. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week.